Among jazz greats, one name stands out. Albert Ayler. Mystery and controversy shroud him. Some hailed Ayler as a visionary, while others saw him as a madman. His brief, brilliant career would leave a lasting mark on music, but it would end in tragedy on the shores of the East River. In jazz history, few figures are as large or as enigmatic as Albert Ayler. He was a saxophonist of unmatched intensity and vision. He had a brief but brilliant career that left a lasting mark on free jazz music. His story is, at its core, linked to the heart of New York City. It embodies artistic triumph, personal struggle, and culminates in a tragic mystery. This jazz innovator's life and death hold many lessons. They reveal the forces that shaped his genius and caused his early death. Born in Cleveland, Ohio, in 1936, Albert Ayler showed early promise as a musician. But what childhood experiences set him on the path to becoming a revolutionary force in jazz? The young Ayler immersed himself in music during his early years. His father, Edward, introduced him to the sax at a young age. This early exposure would prove crucial. But it was more than family that drove Ayler's passion. What inner fire burned within the young musician? Even as a teen, Ayler had a sense that he was meant to do something revolutionary in music. From an early age, Ayler experienced a profound spiritual connection through music. This wasn't just about religious doctrine, but a deep, mystical sense of the transcendent power of sound. This spiritual fire drove him to seek expression beyond conventional musical forms. As Ayler honed his craft in his hometown, he grew restless. Traditional jazz forms constrained him. His restless spirit and innovative music making were clear. But the conservative Midwest was not equipped to nurture such a maverick talent. Ayler needed a bigger stage, a more receptive audience, and like-minded artists. New York City beckoned, promising freedom, opportunity, and the chance to revolutionize jazz. But what challenges awaited him in the cutthroat world of New York's music scene? Arriving in New York in the early 1960s, Ayler found himself at the epicenter of a musical revolution. The city was alive with the sounds of bebop, hard bop, and the stirrings of free jazz. Giants like John Coltrane, Ornette Coleman, and Cecil Taylor were pushing jazz's limits. How did Ayler fit into this vibrant, ever-evolving landscape? And how would he distinguish himself among such towering figures? The answer lay in Ayler's unique approach to his instrument and to music itself. His performance style was raw and primal. It was unlike anything before. Ayler rejected traditional harmony and rhythm. He made a sound that was both old and new. The roots were in spiritual and folk traditions, but they were also very modern. But what was the source of this revolutionary sound? The ecstatic energy of gospel music was a significant influence. Ayler's playing often mimicked the passionate cries and shouts of gospel singers, translating this spiritual intensity to the saxophone. He was fascinated by music from Africa, India, and the Middle East. Despite its free jazz nature, Ayler's music retained a deep blues feeling. Ayler developed unique playing techniques to achieve his distinctive sound, which included extreme overblowing to produce a raw, intense tone and a wide vibrato that could sound like human cries or animal noises. As Ayler gained fame in New York's avant-garde circles, he drew both fans and critics. Critics described his performances as everything from earth-shattering to unlistenable. What was it about Ayler's music that provoked such extreme reactions? And how did he navigate the often hostile reception to his groundbreaking work? His approach to dealing with criticism and misunderstanding was multifaceted and evolved over time. He often framed his music in spiritual terms, viewing negative reactions as a lack of spiritual understanding rather than a failure of his art. He focused on cultivating a dedicated group of supporters, including fellow musicians, critics, and fans who understood and appreciated his work. To some extent, Ayler learned to embrace the controversial nature of his music, understanding that strong reactions, even negative ones, indicated he was making an impact. It was during this period that Ayler found a home with the avant-garde label ESP Disc. His recordings for the label, like Spiritual Unity and Bells, would make him a pioneer of free jazz. 
But what was the story behind these groundbreaking sessions? What happened in the studio as Ayler and his collaborators created these revolutionary works? Witnesses to these sessions describe a trance-like state in Ayler and his collaborators. He often arrived at the studio with little to no pre-written material. The release of these albums catapulted Ayler to the forefront of the avant-garde movement. He became a figurehead for a new generation of musicians seeking to break free from the constraints of traditional jazz. But with this newfound prominence came increased scrutiny and pressure. How did Ayler handle the weight of expectation? And what toll did it take on his personal life and mental health? Like many musicians of his era, Ayler turned to drugs and alcohol to cope with the pressures of his career. The pressure to continually produce groundbreaking work, coupled with financial struggles, substance abuse, and possibly untreated mental health issues, created a perfect storm that Ayler was ultimately unable to weather. His substance abuse likely worsened his mental health issues. It also may have contributed to his erratic behavior. In the later years of his life, Ayler exhibited increasing signs of paranoia. He spoke of others following him and believed that his music could heal the sick and stop wars. To escape the intensity of New York, Ayler went to Europe. There, he found a more receptive audience for his experimental sound. His performances and recordings from this period show an artist at his peak. He was confident in his vision and unafraid to push into new musical territory. But what attracted Ayler to Europe and what prompted his eventual return to New York? Europe, especially the Scandinavian countries and France, were open to avant-garde jazz. Musicians like Ornette Coleman had found success there. At the time, Europe had better prospects for jazz musicians. It had higher paying gigs and more recording opportunities. This was especially attractive given Ayler's financial struggles in New York. Ayler's time in Europe helped him grow and gain recognition. It let him refine his vision and gain confidence in his unique jazz style. But New York's cultural significance, art, and connections drew him back. Upon his return to the States, Ayler's music began to evolve once again. He incorporated elements of R&B, rock, and even bagpipe music into his compositions. This shift puzzled many of his fans and critics alike. Was this a natural growth in his art, or was he bending to commercial pressures? And how did this new direction affect his standing in the jazz community? While commercial pressures likely played a role in Ayler's musical evolution, it would be overly simplistic to view this change solely as a concession to market demands. Ayler's artistic journey was complex and multifaceted, influenced by a combination of personal, artistic, cultural, and commercial factors. His incorporation of diverse musical elements can be seen as both a natural progression of his restless creativity and a response to the changing musical landscape of the late 1960s. As the 1960s drew to a close, Ayler found himself at a crossroads. His music grew more spiritual and apocalyptic. It reflected the era's political and social upheavals. Albums like New Grass and Music is the Healing Force of the Universe revealed an artist wrestling with deep questions about life and meaning. But what personal demons was Ayler battling during this period? And how did they manifest in his music and behavior? Despite his influence, Ayler often felt misunderstood and isolated within the jazz community. He began to isolate himself from former collaborators and the broader jazz scene. He began to see himself as a spiritual leader with a divine mission. Chronic financial instability was a significant source of stress for Ayler. His playing could be brilliant one night and erratic the next. The circumstances surrounding Albert Ayler's death in November 1970 remain shrouded in mystery and speculation. Authorities found his body in New York's East River. They listed drowning as the cause of death. But questions persist about the events leading up to this tragic end. What was Ayler's state of mind in his final days? Were there warning signs that went unheeded? Some have cited Ayler's paranoia and erratic behavior before his death. Others have suggested foul play or even government involvement given Ayler's association with radical political movements. But what evidence, if any, supports these theories? And why has the truth remained so elusive for over half a century? Since his death, Albert Ayler's influence on jazz and experimental music has grown. 
His bold, improvised style has inspired generations of musicians across genres. But what is it about Ehlers' music that resonates today? As we reflect on the life and death of Albert Ehler, we find ourselves with as many questions as answers. What might he have accomplished had he lived longer? How would his music have continued to evolve? What can we learn from his struggles and triumphs? They may help us as we face our own artistic and personal challenges. The story of Albert Ehler is more than a cautionary tale of artistic genius cut short. It shows the power of vision and music's ability to transform. In his brief but brilliant career, Ehler redefined jazz. He challenged listeners to open their minds to new sounds. Albert Ehler's life and death remains a subject of fascination and debate. His music inspires and challenges. It's a beacon of freedom in a conformist world. His recordings invite us to ponder his life's unanswered questions. They urge us to seek our own artistic and personal growth. In the end, that is Ehler's greatest legacy. It is a call to find our own unique voice and pursue it. We should do this with the same passion and fearlessness that defined his brief, remarkable career. This is One Track Jazz. Thanks for listening and don't forget to like and subscribe.